Hello the internet and welcome back to my channel. This is part 3 of the Reparathon series for the PlayStation 3. If you haven't watched part 1 and 2, I do recommend that you go and watch them. The links are down below in the description. Now in part 1 I managed to fix a faulty PlayStation, but in part 2 unfortunately I was unable to fix another faulty PlayStation. Now in episode number 3 we have a special guest. It's a PlayStation 2 compatible machine, so as you can imagine it's quite an important one. Now for those who don't know, I have tried to repair a PlayStation 2 compatible before and it didn't go very well. The link is down below in the description if you go if you want to go and have a look, but no, it didn't go very well. So this time I tried to do better. Now, I know that not many of my viewers reach the very end of the video where I usually do my outro, so I just wanted to mention that I sent all the PlayStations that I managed to repair in this repairathon to someone. And the reason is, I feel this person is able to squeeze 100% of them in terms of refurbishment and also do a special treatment to them. And if you stick with me until the end of the video, I'll uh, reveal what happened to the PlayStations that I managed to fix in this series. So let's not waste any more time and let's crack on with this PlayStation 2 compatible machine. Let's move on to the third and last PlayStation. This is a special model. As you can see from the sticker, this is a CECH CO3. It means that this is a PlayStation 2 hardware compatible. I'm not sure whether it's hardware or software, but anyways, this is one of the very first PlayStation 3. So this is actually making this unit a little valuable. Um, I understand that once fully refurbished and, and fully working, uh, they, they can sell for a decent amount of money. Now, unfortunately, the door here, this is where the compact flash SD card and this is where the Sony memory card, I can't remember the name of it. This is where the door, which is basically protecting this area, uh, is missing, but it's not broken. I can see there's just the door missing. So hopefully, you know, someone can could find a replacement and just have it 100%. The other special thing of this machine is that it's another factory seal one, and which is, again, very good. Uh, assuming it hasn't been melted down like the previous one, it means that nobody has been tinkering with the internal components. Oh, and I forgot the most important things. This works. Uh, at least I tested it and it works totally fine. So these actually needs a little clean. And I would say if I feel brave enough, a delete, maybe a factory reset, and this would be ready for a new home. So what I'm going to do with this one, I'm going to open it up, inspect it, clean it. Then I will test it thoroughly, make sure everything works. And uh, at some point, I guess towards the end of the video, I will delete this PlayStation for maximum reliability in the future. Now, before I move any further, I believe this is an APS-227 and I have repaired a similar power supply in one of my previous video, which you can find linked below. Uh, I'd like to test it because I never had a PlayStation to test it. So before disassembling everything, I'd like to just to disassemble the power supply and plug my power supply and see whether it works. And yes, it is indeed an APS-227, so fantastic. I finally have an opportunity to test the power supply I have repaired. So let me find it and I'll install it and we'll test it. Okay, I've got the power supply which I repaired and it's plugged in, it's, it's got power. Let's power it up and let's see what happens. There you go, I guess the my repair was successful after all. And yes, this PlayStation seems to be working totally fine. So I can hear the fans has, have sped up a bit, but I think it's normal for these older versions to, to run a bit louder uh, during the game. So again, next step is to open it up, clean it, replace the thermal paste, and, uh, and then we'll see how it works. And I've got the board out. I'm uh, pretty impressed by this unit. Uh, first of all, there's very little dust for being such an old unit. I mean, that's the that's the case. I haven't touched it. As you can see, yes, it's been working, but really not a lot. The fan, as you can see, it, it it's barely dirty. I mean, I feel that this PlayStation is almost brand new. And one thing that really surprises me, yes, the thermal paste is kind of old, 
but it's not completely dry as you can see it's not completely dry usually the thermal paste on this very old machine is it's totally completely dry you can actually see here on the on the cpu it, it's still wet look it's amazing I, I, I never seen anything i mean i haven't got a great deal of experience with playstations but it's pretty impressive so what I'm gonna do with this board is to replace the thermal paste and then I would like to test it thoroughly before even thinking of deleting anything. I just wanna make sure it works. But one thing I wanna do, even though this seems to be working, is to connect to Syscon and see whether there's any recurring error messages because the thing is this might be working when I'm testing it for uh, even if I leave it on or whatever but you might have experienced some errors in the past so with Cisco I can see the previous I think it's the previous 30 error messages and I can see if there's anything weird that that might point to something wrong with this board so let me uh, solder the leads for connecting to the Cisco remove the thermal paste, replacing it, then reinstall everything, we'll check Syscon together, and then I'll just test it. Right, as before, I have my serial adapter connected to the PlayStation. The PlayStation is powered, so let's try and see if we can connect with Syscon. And we are in. So let's have a look at the error logs. Now we got an A080101. So let's take a look at what that means. Right, the 1001, it's a power issue with the CPU. Now, if you read through this description, yes, it could be some capacitor problem, the usual thing, but to be honest, 1001 errors can be logged naturally when the system encounters an unexpected shutdown or AC power loss. I'd be tempted to think that whoever used that PlayStation before me or whatever, they just pulled the cord or just, uh, you know, switched it off abruptly without letting the PlayStation gracefully shut down. Now, in theory, I could check these field to see when that happened. Uh, I can try and look into that because I'm not sure. But what I definitely want to do is to see whether all the subsequent errors, actually the previous errors, were all the same or if there's something else. And so far, as you can see, they're all the same, one, zero, zero, one. Uh, well, actually, there is a 1004. Let's take a look. And again, when the console loses AC power. So either there's a problem with the power supply or simply the PlayStation was not shut down properly and that happened over time. Okay, with this PlayStation here, I really would like to enable what is called the internal mode. I'm not too familiar with these things, but I've done this before on my previous video. And it's basically a way to send more commands and to see more things from Syscon. What I'm curious to see is how many hours this console has, as it was very clean. And also I believe that in internal mode, then I have a bit more details of the error codes. What I'm looking for is the, the dates of the error codes, which again, I, I feel they are normal improper shutdown of this console, but I'm just curious. So in order to do that, at some point I will have to um, connect the DIAC cable or pin, uh, which is connected to the yellow cable, to ground. And I've added this extra um, terminal strip on this um, little adapter board, and there's a ground pin on it, so I can just plug it in. And all I'm doing, I'm following some someone else's instructions. You know, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't invented this. Everything is linked down below, so you should be able to find a very nice package with all the information that you need to do this. And I'm in internal mode, so I have authorized already, and uh, I can issue the command called bcount. That should give me the uptime of the whole PlayStation. Let's have a look. So this PlayStation has been switched on 452 times, and it's been shut down 412. So 40 times has been the plug has been pulled from the wall, <laughs> or the power supply failed. And we have, as I suspected, only 28 days of power on. So this console is barely used. It's, it's absolutely impressive. It's more or less brand new. Wow. The other command I'd like to try, I think it's air log. Yes. So we have now all our codes here. You should be able to see. It's basically a different formatting of, of the same codes we were having before. But these are the codes. You see it says 801001. We have a 1004 every now and then, but they're mostly 1001. Well, I'm trying to look here, 2019. So this console, assuming this is correct, something that concerns me a bit 
is that all these error messages are March, February, or February, and then January. So either these dates are incorrect, or whoever was using the PlayStation the last, was that, 20 times, didn't know how to switch it off. <laughs> and they were just uh, switching it off from the wall every time. Or the power supply has a problem, which is possible. The other important thing is I don't see any other error message besides this 2203. Well, 2203 is a Southbridge error. I have no idea what it could mean, to be honest. Southbridge maybe is controlling the hard drive and the USBs. Maybe something happened with that. Some devices connected to the Southbridge failed and you end up with the error message. Honestly, I do not know. But the thing is, it's only one. So I'd like to think that that was just a one-off. All the others are 1001 or 1004. So that's great. The next stop is going to be testing this thing. I will just put it back together and I will test it uh, to see whether the power supply is reliable or not. And if it is, then, uh, well, I guess whoever had this PlayStation before didn't know how to switch it off. Right, the PlayStation still works, which is a good thing. I forgot to put the battery back, so obviously it's lost the date. Uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, next step, I'll use it. I'll play it for a while. I'll keep it on for a day or two. I guess I'll spend a few hours just uh, gaming with this thing. I've now been using this PlayStation for a couple of days. I'm not a gamer, but I like racing games. I tested it with Need for Speed Hot Pursuit and Burnout Paradise. I've also tested Grand Theft Auto because I've heard it's pretty heavy on the system. Well, at the beginning the PlayStation seemed to have some issues. It was getting stuck on some games and it crashed on me during an update. I'm no expert on PlayStation, but I had a similar issue before with another unit, so I decided to get into the recovery menu, wipe the hard drive and do a full reinstall of the later software. After that, the PlayStation 3 behaved perfectly fine, no issues whatsoever. Well, um, on one occasion I felt the PlayStation just switched off by itself, but I was moving it around and I admit I did not really fully reassemble it for testing, so that might not be unexpected when half of the screws are outside of the PlayStation. This PlayStation 3 runs a bit hot and noisy, but it's one of the first models with a 90 nanometer RSX, and I think it's kind of normal for these machines to run a bit hot. Also, I have not deleted it yet, so the thermal pace between the IHS and the DIES is basically 16 years old. So, my next step with this one would be to delete it. I've done one successfully already, so I feel confident enough to try again on a COK002, which if you remember is like the board that I unfortunately destroyed on one of my previous videos. So uh, let's disassemble this unit and go ahead. Now, I just would like to thank uh, Timbo, my friend from PSX Place. He recommended a very good thing. When you disassemble these uh, units, usually the board is kind of stuck. It doesn't come out because it's stuck on the heat sinks. His recommendation is, which I'm gonna test it straight away, uh, to run the PlayStation like 20 minutes before disassembling it. And that basically uh, softens up the thermal paste between the um, chips and the heat sinks. So hopefully this is going to be a bit easier than all the others I've ever disassembled. And the board is out, so let's remove the thermal paste and proceed with the delete. And uh, because this is a COK002, it's exactly the same board that I used before, I can reuse this wooden template which uh, holds the PlayStation in place, but most importantly, because the PlayStation has these two lugs uh, which are always holding, keeping the board uh, at an angle if you use it on a desk, at least it's just nice and stable while I'm working on it. Okay, I'm ready to proceed. As last time, I will start with the um, RSX chip. The process is the same, I'm using my hot air station to warm up the IHS, so to loosen up the adhesive and the thermal paste underneath without disturbing the rest of the chip. Then I'm using this painter knife as a base for this metal tool, which I use as a lever to pry open the IHS itself. It's a process I don't particularly like, but usually it works pretty well and there's usually not much resistance offered by the IHS itself. As you can see, it comes off pretty easily. The GPU is done. I have to say that once you get the hand of doing it, it's pretty simple and I don't feel I'm placing too much stress on the PCB at all. And if you look at the paste here, as you can see, it is completely dry. 
Now let's move on and do the, the fun one, the CPU. The lead in the CPU is definitely more complicated. I still warm up the IHS so the silicon can loosen up a bit. I use a little bit of oil because I feel that the tool can slide a bit better. And I found these unit a bit tougher than the other ones as the silicon seem to be a bit harder. So the tough part is to cut into the silicon. And once you do that, it's like cutting into, let's say, very cold butter. Maybe a bit worse than that, but uh, I'm speeding up the process now. And you see that once I get through the silicon, it's actually not too bad. Now, my tool is definitely too big, so I kept clashing uh, with components all around the IHS. So I had to start cutting from different sides, uh, trying to avoid components and try not to destroy anything. Um, but in the end, I could make it and uh, I managed to remove this IHS. Right, I think it worked. What I think I'm gonna do, I think I need to make a smaller tool so that I can go around everything uh, without having the, the larger painter knife in the way, just hitting on capacitors and everything. But it worked pretty well, finger crossed. I don't see damage or any sort. And yeah, the thermal paste is completely dry on this one as well. And yes, I'm uh, very aware that the best way is to attach the IHS on the heatsink first and then put the PlayStation back on top. Don't ask me why I went this way and you'll see me in a second just uh, holding the PlayStation with the hand trying to keep the IHSs in place while I'm screwing the, the holders back. I don't know. Right, almost there. Um, this PlayStation is really in great shape here, as, as we checked from uh, Cisco and it's barely used. Now, the door for the memory cards, which is, uh, which is an exclusive of the PlayStation 2 compatible ones, is missing. I only have the, the hinge is actually working, the door is missing. Now, I have a PlayStation 2 compatible shell, which is in slightly worse shape than that one. So I'd like to just uh, uh, remove the door and just use it on this one. Why not? Let's, let's hope I don't break anything. Oh, well. Voila. Here we go, a beautiful PlayStation 2 compatible PlayStation 3 fat. Now, will it work? Let's give it a go. So power on, we have a red light. I haven't tested it. Three, two, one, go. And it's working, that's fantastic. Again, if you watched my previous video, I had exactly the same model, which I managed to repair like 70%, and then I destroyed the motherboard when I tried to delete it. So I'm really so happy. This is kind of my way to say sorry to the PlayStation entity, whatever is out there. <laughs> and say, hey, no, I've actually managed to save, uh, well, to save that was working, but you know, to properly restored one. So fantastic, this is a success. I would like to give you an update on the board I tried to repair unsuccessfully on my previous video. This is the SEM001, which I tried to reflow last time. And if you go back and watch my videos, you will know that basically what happened was, well, it didn't work, number one. Number two, after a couple of attempts, it would basically power up as in showing the green light without doing anything. Just the green light, no 12 volts, and I couldn't connect to Cisco. So I was stuck in there, I asked on the communities, nobody had never seen anything like that. And to be honest, I gave up because I thought, well, something massive must have happened. Meanwhile, in between this video and my previous video, I realized that there are schematics available for these boards. I wasn't aware of that. Apparently schematics are only available on the older models, but the SEM001 is one of those. 
So I thought, you know what, I, you know, just a curiosity, I, I took a look at the schematics, and obviously, because this board refuses to start to 12 volts, there's not much to check. Basically, you only have 5 volts going in, and I guess you have some regulation happening for the 5 volts, uh, probably going to the, mainly to the Cisco chip. So I thought, you know, let's try and follow those traces, check those components, and see if I see anything. I just thought, you know, I'll just give it a, a last go. This is the 5 volt connector, it's this little connector here which comes from the power supply and it basically uh, only gives 5 volts to the, to the board, so the board is basically in constant standby and it will only activate the 12 volts when the power button is, is pushed. Sony calls it the 5 volts EVA, I guess, you know, it's always there. Then you have ground and then you have um, the uh, control to switch on the rest of the power supply and supply 12 volts. Now, if I'm looking at the 5 volts, this is going through four different regulations. They've got four chips here, IC, 6004, 6005, 6006, and 6009. And they end up generating 3.3 uh, EVA, 5 EVA, 1.8 EVA, and 3.3 thermal. These are the four voltages which these components are generating. Well, the idea was, you know, let's find these components and see whether we have any outputs. So it's a shot in the dark, but, you know, that's probably all I can do, to be honest. And, you know, if that doesn't work, you can follow those voltages, see where they're going. I didn't have much hope. Now, imagine my surprise when I gave power to this board, do this now, and it didn't switch on like did last time. It's, it's, there's a red light. Wait a minute, what's going on here? And when I try and push the on-off button, well, you can clearly hear the power supply switching on and the board, as you would expect without the power supply connected, is basically complaining that there's no 12 volts. Now, what's going on here? <laughs> this wasn't working before. It fixed itself over the past few weeks. I have no idea. Now, I've been testing this thing. Well, testing. I've been playing with this for, a, I don't know, like half an hour. And yeah, it behaves the way it's supposed to be. Now I'm assuming that if I power out the board fully with the heat sinks and everything, put everything back together, it will still come up with a yellow light of death. But that's not the point. It wasn't doing that. It was doing that weird thing that you had the green light and it wasn't doing anything. It wasn't switching on the power supply. Very weird. Uh, I, I have absolutely no idea what happened. Does that mean I can connect to Cisco now and everything is back as it's supposed to be, as you would expect? So I went ahead, I plugged my um, serial adapter, and uh, if I try and connect to Siskin, it does work. I have absolutely no idea why this thing is now working. If I'm getting the error log, all the final, the latest error logs are 3001. And if I search for error log 3001, I get 12 volts power failure, which is exactly what's happening to this board because simply the power supply is not plugged in. Now I can't plug in the power supply and test it. If it happens to work, it will try and power up the CPU and the GPU. So, you know, I, I want to make sure there's a heatsink running or, you know, I do it in a safe way. Well, I guess since I'm here, maybe uh, we can still check those voltages out of curiosity. Okay, so, um, well, Sony, in their infinite wisdom, haven't really put the labels on components on the board. So what I have to do, I have to use the actual board layout, which is not too bad because you can actually search for components. So I'm searching the first component, which is the IC6004, and it's just behind the Cisco chip. And here I am. So I basically, it's a component with four legs. I basically have two grounds more or less and an input and an output. This pin here is reading 3.2. Uh, 6004 is supposed to output 3.3 volts. It's outputting 3.36, 26, which is totally fine. And I'm guessing if I'm checking this pin here, I probably have the five volts input. Yep, that's it, 4.98. So 6004 is fine. 6005 and 6006 are very close to 6004. So they're all behind the Cisco chip, which is, is responsible for the power distribution more or less of the PlayStation 3, so it makes sense that they are close to the Cisco. 6005 is the 3.3 EVA. <laughs> I like this naming. And here our 3.3 volts. So 3.3 volts out is fine. And one of these two is going to be the 5 volts in. There you go. Uh, let's check on the other one, which is going to be the 1.8 EVA. And you can see actually it says 1.8 and 3.3. Oh, I didn't see that. I didn't notice that. So this is going to be my 1.8. Yeah, there you go, 1.8. And then we have IC6009, which is on the other side and end of the board. Uh, no, actually on, only on the other side. And it's uh, close to the battery and still by the Cisco, because I think that's the Cisco. 
and this should be the 3.3 volts thermal and we have 3.3 exactly so the voltages now work but the board also work uh, works and i wasn't expecting that to be honest so that didn't go the way I was expecting, I was expecting to troubleshoot this thing and see by any chance I could see some voltages missing or anything, but now the board works, so I do not know. I guess we might try another reflow, maybe on another episode uh, um, when I have time, but yeah, it looks like this board fixed itself with time. So I think this is it for this video and also this is the end of my repair-a-thon. I've run out of PlayStations, that was the last one. Uh, it's two PlayStation out of three, I'm pretty happy with the outcome, even though I still feel sorry for PlayStation number two, particularly because I still haven't mastered my uh, reflow and BGA reworking abilities. I've been working on that for a while and uh, I'm still working on it and as soon as I have some uh, new development, new skills, and new procedures, I would be more than happy to share my findings with you. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I don't have these PlayStations anymore. I sent the, the first PlayStation and the one that we just serviced in this video to my friend Tim Dark, uh, aka Timbo on PSX Plays. Tim Dark refurbishes PlayStation 3 consoles on a regular basis, basically. He makes sure that everything is working fine. He installs uh, custom firmware to make sure that the fans are running at a higher speed than Sony stock, so to try and reduce the thermal stress inside the PlayStations, particularly the, the older models, which are a bit less reliable in terms of, of uh, RSX chips. And he also applies liquid metal between the die and the IHS for improved thermals. And the results is pretty much amazing every time. Now, I could do that myself, to be honest. You know, I just, I just probably need to educate myself on what to do and probably buy some liquid metal and so on. But Tim has some unique skills as he refurbishes these PlayStations in white. So the case becomes a beautiful white color. It looks absolutely amazing. I've seen some videos and they look absolutely fantastic. These PlayStations are fully refurbished with extra pads, with custom firmware, with liquid metal, and uh, they're tested, properly tested to make sure they are uh, fully reliable. And they, they look absolutely, absolutely amazing. Now, the video for the first PlayStation, the one which I repaired by replacing the tokens, is already online and you can uh, it's linked down below in my description. You can just go and watch it. I believe the video for the third PlayStation, the, the one we just serviced, has not been published yet. I'm so looking forward to that because, again, this machine is more or less mint. It's almost brand new and I can only imagine how it can look in white and fully refurbished. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna install liquid metal, but it's gonna be absolutely stunning. So thank you very much, team, for all your help over the past few months. Uh, obviously, he's been my kind of go-to reference whenever I had any questions or whatever, because obviously he's working on many more PlayStations than I do. And I'm really happy that I sent those PlayStation to Tim, because again, Tim can turn them into real gems. That's it. So I hope you enjoyed this series. I thoroughly did. Uh, it's been kind of a challenge because obviously uh, it's three videos. I shoot them more or less all three at the same time. And then I had to edit them all together in, in three different parts because otherwise it was, it was going to become a very, very long video. I hope you enjoyed this. I don't have any more PlayStations to fix at the moment. I actually have two PlayStation 4 which I need to look into at some point. So if you're interested in the PlayStation world, watch the space because they will come at some point. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate if you could hit the like button down below and uh, uh, consider subscribing to this channel if you like what I'm doing here. For now, as usual, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day and uh, I also hope to see you soon here again on my channel for my next video. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye.